Aloha and Talofa. I am excited to be able to introduce my companion of 41 years as today's devotional speaker, Elder Robert Cochran. He was born July 5th, just a few years ago. He is the youngest of three children born to Albert and Geraldine Cochran in Akron, Ohio. His parents were both converts to the church. His dad was baptized in Georgia and his mother in Ohio. His family wasn't always active, so when it came time for Elder Cochran to serve a mission, he and his parents felt that it was his mission to take care of them since his dad was legally blind and his mom never had learned how to drive. It wasn't until after having an Enos type experience in the Sacred Grove in Palmyra, New York, that he, was, that he knew that by the Spirit that he was to serve a mission. He was called to serve in the Belfast, Ireland mission at age 23. This prepared him for the rest of his life. We had met briefly before his mission when my mother and I were investigating the church. I know he is going to say more about our meeting, so I will just say, it was great. <laughs> we were married October 4th in the Manti Temple in Manti, Utah. Since there were no temples at that time east of Utah, we borrowed my mom's car, packed everything up, and drove 4,000 miles by ourselves without any family to be married where we knew Heavenly Father would want us to begin our lives together in the temple. We were happy because of that decision, and still are. While we were dating, I had asked Elder Cochran why he had never been to college. He told me that he hadn't thought about it and that he didn't think he was smart enough. I assured him that I thought he would do fine. That is, until I saw his high school transcript. <laughs> that brought some serious doubt to my mind, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> but he studied and studied, and then he took the ACT test and miraculously scored in the upper 80 percentile of the nation. We had mixed emotions of shock, gratitude, and excitement. He later told me that he had prayed to the Lord that if he was supposed to go to school, that he, the Lord, would have to help him get there. And help him he did. He was accepted to Brigham Young University. Elder Cochran had also been given a blessing by our bishop that he should go and not look back. And that is what we did. What a ride it has been as the Lord has blessed us along the way. This man who did so poorly in high school and had not even thought of going to college proved that he could do it. Like so many of you, you can do it. He was 31 when he graduated cum laude from BYU with his bachelor's degree in communications public relations and was also inducted into the National Journalism Society, an honor not bestowed upon many. He was hired by the church education system to teach seminary and institute in Mesa, Arizona, which he did for 30 wonderful years. He also earned his master's degree in organizational communications from Brigham Young University. Elder Cochran has served in many church callings, such as bishop, ward missionary, and a counselor in two stake presidencies. And I have to just add here that he has avoided being, being called to be the scoutmaster, which he's grateful for. <laughs> he's not a camper. <laughs> he has also enjoyed serving in the Mesa, Arizona, and La Ea temples as an ordinance worker. He has a passion for teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and for doing missionary work. Everywhere we go, including riding the bus, we don't have a car, he talks to everyone about the church. And he's good at it. I sit there and it, well, I look at him and he just flows out of his mouth. And I stumble all over the place like I just did. I do keep trying to follow his example, though, in being a good missionary. He has a fervent love for our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and in their great work upon this earth. He has enjoyed so much our two missions, the first one to Southern Virginia University as CES missionaries, and our mission that we are currently serving here in paradise at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. 
He teaches in the religion department and has been blessed to have had many of you wonderful students in his classes. I am also blessed to be able to serve with him in those classes, and we love it. You have amazing dis testimonies of the gospel, the Book of Mormon, and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have felt the spirit that radiates from each one of you. You have touched our souls, and we love you. My husband has been a wonderful companion and husband to me. He has been a fun and loving father to our three beautiful daughters and our wonderful son, who have also been blessed with wonderful companions and were all married in the Mesa, Arizona temple. And yes, we have 13 of the bestest grandchildren ever, who he loves to spoil and play with, and so do I. My husband's favorite scripture is Doctrine and Covenants 6-8. Verily, verily, I say unto you, even as you desire of me, as it shall be unto you. And if you desire, you shall be the means of doing much good in this generation. This has been my husband's motto and desire for his life, to do much good in this generation. I would like to present my husband, my eternal companion, who I love dearly and with all my heart, Elder Robert Cochran. She makes me sound better than I am. <laughs> I'd like her to do that more. This makes me feel, wow, is that me? That is so good. <laughs> Can I say something uh, to this magnificent choir that took my breath away again? I believe that now and then the heavens are parted. And I believe we have an opportunity for moments to look into the world beyond and the world to come. I believe that we hear the music of heaven when we hear these magnificent numbers by the choir. I believe if you kept that music in your heart and in your life, you would never be troubled by Satan. He would not come near you. The power of that music and the strength it brings would give you a strength that he could not overcome. I pray the Lord will bless you with that strength. My dear brothers and sisters, aloha. I am grateful to have this opportunity to share with you my thoughts. I tell my students in our hymns class, it only becomes a prayer when you sing the words from your heart, and it only becomes of the Spirit when you speak the words from your heart. I hope today that my words will truly come from the depths of my heart, and that the Spirit may ratify to you that what I speak is true. Sister Cochran and I have loved our experience here more than we can ever express. We do not look forward to the end of our mission, which is coming faster than we want it to. I, the end of a mission is much like the second coming. It is a great and dreadful day. <laughs> we have a granddaughter who was born just days before we left to come back after a visit home in the summer. We've seen pictures of her all the time. We cannot wait to hold her. We cannot wait to be with our family, our children. That is the great part of the day. The dreadful part is, as we go home, a chapter in our life will close. And with it will be a very a sorrow to us. We honestly can say that we love so many of you, that you have touched our heart far more than we have ever been able to touch yours and we will carry you home in our memories forever and forever. We count this mission as one of our greatest blessings. When I was growing up, food markets would advertise shopping sprees, a contest where you could win so much time, and push your shopping cart through the store, put as much as you could get in it, and race across the line. When I thought about that, I thought, I used to dream of winning one of those. I even planned out exactly what I would do. I'd race down the aisle where all the expensive meats and steak and ham, I was gonna get the most for my time. That was a great, exciting thing to me. I never did win that contest, but I still hope I might. <laughs> there was a comedy show years ago called Laverne and Shirley. I don't know that you remember it or have seen any of the reruns. 
But in one of the episodes of this show, they had Laverne and Shirley had won such a contest. The day came when they came to the supermarket so excited, and the bell sounded, and off they went. It depicted them, though, however, arguing as to what was going to go in their basket. Shirley would put something in, and Laverne would say, no, no, and she'd throw it out. This went back and forth, tugging at the cart, this aisle, no, this aisle, until suddenly the one-minute bell sounded. They were panicked. They raced for the checkout stand. It depicts them reaching the line, falling across the, the line with a box of macaroni and cheese. <laughs> One day while I was thinking back upon this episode, though, I realized that we have an opportunity to participate in this activity. When we were born, we received a shopping cart. This is for a short list of groceries. <laughs> Each of us received such a cart and the privilege of pushing this cart throughout our life. We can put things in this cart as we go through life. At the end of life, however, we will pass through the checkout stand. That is called death. That is the moment of truth. That is where we will see how wise a shopper we have been. I would like to share with you today a few things that I have put in my cart. Now and then I reflect on the tender mercies that Heavenly Father has so kindly done for me. It would be very hard to pick the greatest blessing that you ever receive. But as I have contemplated this idea, I have decided that being chosen to be a son of God must top the list. As youth, we would choose sides to play street baseball or street football. How I wanted to be chosen. I was not the biggest or the fastest or the best. I just wanted to be a part of it. I'm sure I must have screamed from my heart, pick me, pick me. Being picked gave you some worth, and at least for the moment, you were someone of importance. As God viewed the vast intelligence from whom he would pick or select those who would become his spirits, sons and daughters, I have wondered, and I really mean this with all my heart, I have wondered what he saw in me. I am sure I was not the most intelligent. I'm not sure what I was. But for whatever reason, he did pick me, and I was born as a son, a spirit son of God. Things would get even better. Later, he would pick me again to be part of a select group who would have important assignments on Earth. I must have felt an overwhelming joy being chosen to be what would be termed the noble and the great. And the Lord said, I will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things. And they who keep their first estate shall be added upon Abraham 3, 25 and 26. Again, I asked the question, what did God see in me? Whatever it was he saw in me, I know he saw the same thing in you. We must have done something good to have kept our first estate because here we are in the most exciting time with the greatest opportunity to do so much good. I consider it my greatest blessing to be Robert Henry Cochran, son of God. I have put my patriarchal blessing in my cart. It reminds me of who I am, of what I can become. I would like to share one line from that blessing. Blessings are sacred, and they should be shared most carefully, not usually read in public, but only as you feel to share it. But I would like to share this one line. It says, he will hear and answer your every prayer. How special does that make me feel, that God knows me and loves me and will always hear me? One other thing I would add in my blessing. It said, 
you will teach the gospel in the nations of the world. When I served my mission in Ireland, I also had the privilege of serving in the Isle of Man. Both of those were separate nations. That would justify and, and fulfill that idea of teaching the gospel to the nations of the world. And I assume perhaps my blessing was fulfilled. But I did not realize that coming here would be a greater fulfillment. It has been my privilege to teach the gospel to marvelous sons and daughters of God from across the face of this beautiful earth. Thus, my blessing is even greater fulfilled, for which I thank God with all my heart. A second item in my card is my marriage certificate. This represents my best friend, who is also my eternal companion. I cannot express enough my gratitude for her being brought by Heavenly Father into my life. Before my mission, I went to a fireside in Cleveland, Ohio, where three members of a musical group called the Three Ds were speaking. Each one bore testimony that they knew by the Spirit their future wives when they met them. I determined that I wanted that to be my story. I wanted the Spirit to say, there she is. I was so afraid that she would walk in and out of my life and I would never know her. I prayed about that occasionally on my mission and after I returned home. It was now December and I had been home for four months. My mission was over and the Spirit had not pointed anyone out to me. I was 23. I was panicked. I might be an old maid. <laughs> I was getting discouraged and downright worried. Where was she? And where would I have to go to find her? I loved all the girls in my ward, but we were friends, and I could not see anyone else around. <sighs> it was now Christmas, and I had been asked to speak in a sacrament meeting. I was sitting on the stand thinking about my talk and wondering, where's my wife? <laughs> Little did I know that in a few minutes the Lord would answer that prayer and my world would change forever. I looked up from my talk to see Linda Kempel walking in the back of the chapel with her mother. I had met Linda when she was investigating the church and she was baptized the day I left on my mission. She had left the area to go attend Snow College and BYU Provo. I had had no contact with her, nor had I thought of her once on my mission. And now I could not take my eyes off of her. As I looked at her, the spirit poured into me from my head to my toes. I almost thought, what's the spirit doing here? Oh, sacrament meeting, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. <laughs> I was unsure, though, why this feeling had come so powerfully. I looked away from her. I did not want to stare at her. <laughs> and as I looked away from her, the Spirit left. But I could not wait long before I looked at her again, and the Spirit returned and filled me. I looked away again, and again the Spirit left. I looked back, and the Spirit came. <laughs> I almost could hear the Spirit saying, Hey, dummy! There she is! Oh my gosh! Could I be looking at my wife? I was indeed. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. As soon as sacrament meeting was over, I hurried down to talk to her. After a brief hello, I asked her if she remembered me. She said yes, but her eyes said no. <laughs> Being a good missionary, I knew how to act. I asked her immediately to attend a fireside that night with me in Cleveland. She kindly indicated she could not. What? Did she not have the same spirit I had? <laughs> she indicated she needed to go home with her mother to decorate the Christmas tree. I pleaded my case with her mother who looked at me like, ah, potential son-in-law. <laughs> she said, Linda, go with him. She looked at her mom like, you're supposed to have my back, not serve me up on a platter. <sighs> we went on what I considered my, our first date. I must have done something right, because on the drive home from Cleveland, 
she consented to a second date. It would be only a few dates, and then she would be back to BYU on New Year's Day. I had to act fast. I asked her to the New Year's Eve dance at church. She consented. Things were looking up. <sighs> Maybe she was feeling the same spirit that I did. That evening we danced. I was consumed by her beauty. I danced her into the foyer of the church. There in the soft light of a street light, I wish it was moonlight. Whatever. <laughs> I said to her what I had mocked others in saying, I think you are the one. I did not give her time to say yes or no or anything else. I kissed her. <laughs> we danced the rest of the night like a Disney fairy tale. She then left the next day to go back to Provo. She had been gone about two weeks. I was gently coming down from my cloud when I realized that I had asked a girl to marry me who I had only been on three dates with. I didn't really know her. What if she was a vegetarian? <laughs> I love steak. What if she didn't like Motown? I love The Temptations. She might like Megadeth. I, I didn't know. Instead of love, now I felt sheer panic. I called my bishop and told him I needed to see him. He said, what have you done? <laughs> I said, I know, uh, oh, gosh, bishop. I said, I think I'm in love. He laughed. And I said, no, there's more. I think I've asked her to marry me. He said, now you could be in trouble. She may sue you for breach of promise if you do not follow through. He could tell I was not laughing. He said, so what can I do to help? I said, I need a blessing. He responded, okay, I can do that. He began a very sweet blessing. Heavenly Father loves you. And then he stopped. And he didn't say anything. And I thought, he's going to say, be friends. <laughs> While I sat there in silence, the spirit once again filled the room and filled me. Soon he began to speak again. His voice was firm and strong as he said, let your heart be at peace for you have found your companion, and you shall take her to the celestial kingdom. Ah. <laughs> Come on, girls, you do it the best. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Guys, you just go, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look good for a guy to go, ah. See, it's not a guy thing. But girls can do that. He said, she is not ready to know. Be patient and you will know when to tell her. I rushed home immediately after that blessing and called her in Provo. I said, Linda, I know something you don't know. <laughs> and she said, what is it? And I said, I can't tell you. <laughs> not fair, she said, not fair. Well, that went on. We communicated by phone and letter. And finally, she returned home in spring. We began dating, and a day came when the Spirit said to me, tell her everything. As I told her all that I felt and the words of the blessing, tears came to her eyes. And she said, I know what you know, and I know it's true. She accepted a ring and my official proposal of marriage. We were married on October 4th for time and all eternity in the beautiful Manti, Utah temple. A sweeter love story no one could ask for. I am still waiting for Disney to call and offer to make our love story into a movie. <laughs> Look out, Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> our love story is the stuff that dreams are made of. 
Now, I delight in telling it because I believe Heavenly Father loves love stories. I believe that Heavenly Father is a romantist. I believe he loves happy endings. I believe he wants all of his children to have a love story of their own. When I spoke at EFY, one of the topics I spoke of was there is a love story with your name on it. We could not have enough chairs for all the youth who would cram into the hall or the room that I taught. I said to them, I know why you're here. You want to believe there is a love story with your name on it. I testify to you that that is true. Heavenly Father wants you to have a love story. He wants it to be so special. Every love story is a little different because we are different. However, true love stories all have the same things in common. They all involve obedience, staying on the path, the ability to hear and respond to the Spirit, be the right person, be at the right place, doing the right things, and I promise you God will do the rest. You don't have to join one of these dating services. If you are living faithful, you are part of the service of dating heaven style. And God will match you well with someone you will love forever. No one could have told me what the next 41 years would be with her at my side. I wish I had my own description, but I will use the words of President James E. Faust. He said, describing his wife, she is the wind beneath my wings. All that I have done, all that I have become, all that I will ever be is in great part because of her and her encouragement. I never knew you could love someone as I have loved her. The third treasure in my card is our children, each one so special, so unique, each with a value more precious than the riches of the earth these children have given us even greater, wonderful grandchildren. I can truly say, if I did not believe that I could be with my family in the eternities, heaven would hold little interest for me. The fourth thing I have put in my cart is a piece of wood. This wood is from a tree in the sacred grove. I know there are signs forbidding taking items out of the grove. I promise there was no signs when I took this. <laughs> this piece of bark brings memories of a day I spent in prayer in the grove seeking a testimony even as Enos so many years ago. I was not going on a mission. I spent my day telling the Lord why I didn't need to serve a mission, but the Lord told me otherwise. The testimony I gained that day changed my life and sent it in a new direction on a mission to Ireland and then the rest of my life. That day with God in that sacred grove is precious beyond words to me. I want to remember it forever. I'm taking that experience home with me to heaven. Another thing I put in, the cart is this. It is called a kaleidoscope. I enjoyed this amazing toy as a child. It was while on our mission in Virginia that the mission president's wife, Sister Thornock, used this toy to teach a powerful lesson. Sister Thornock explained that a kaleidoscope had two ends through which you could look through. If you looked through one end and rotated it, beautiful images and designs could be seen. If you looked through the other end, a dark frosted picture with no color or beauty could be seen. She likened this to how we look at things in this life. Looking through the eyes of the Spirit, we see the beauty and the good in people and in situations. When looked in the right way, each missionary companion did not see the faults of the other. Equally, husbands will not see or be irritated by the things of a wife or the wife the husband. The Spirit of God is like this. When looking through the eyes of the Spirit, we see the good. We see stepping stones in challenges. It makes all the difference in our life through which end we look. 
I have tried to look through my life the correct end, and I have seen much beauty in things, experiences, and people. It is easy to see the beauty of students here at BYU, Hawaii. Your beauty shines like the light of the gospel. Indeed, with the Spirit, you are beautiful. I have placed in my cart an extra missionary tag. It is hard to explain the feelings of bearing the Savior's name before the world. I often wish it would never end. As we ride the bus or walk in stores, I see people glance at a tag. Some look down, some look away. Some smile and some indicate their members also. There is such an amazing feeling to have the Savior's name on you. Sometimes you need to be reminded, be reminded that it was placed on all of us at our baptism. Satan tries so hard to cause us to forget who we are, what name we bear, and as we do, it is when we do such foolish things. While sitting at the PCC with my wife on a stone wall, a girl of about 14 years with her brother came up to us and said, you're missionaries, aren't you? I was a little surprised. We had on our PCC name tags, not our black missionary tags. I could tell you are, she said. I could tell. I wondered how she could tell, but the fact that she said she could thrilled me. That experience placed a strong desire in my heart that whether we had on a missionary name tag, name tag or not, I hoped others would be able to see and say to us, you are a missionary, aren't you? While at the PCC, a beautiful Oriental couple asked what I thought was to take a picture of them. I said, you want a picture of me to take a picture of you and her? They said, oh no, picture of you and her. Oh, after the picture, I asked, why a picture of us? Because you look so happy, he said. That is another way people can be drawn to us. Our happiness in the gospel transfers to our happiness in life. I have two other items in my cart. They are most precious to me. They are the missionary journal of my father, who is now gone. They are handwritten, and I read them with great care. It tells of his mission to the southern states. They are my link with him. When I read them, his words make me feel that he is near. He tells of a time when he and his companion were street corner preaching. This was done as they selected a street corner. One of the missionaries would stand on a wood box and, stand and preach, declaring that the gospel, uh, that God had called a prophet and the true church of Jesus Christ had been restored to the earth. The other missionary would stand and hand out tracts, pamphlets, Book of Mormons to whomever. My father had worn out his shoes. There were holes in the bottom of his shoes and he had been using cardboard to keep from getting holes in his socks. He had no money. In those days, you literally went, verse or script, you went with whatever money you had. You stayed as long as your money would hold out. He wrote in his journal of a day when he had been street corner preaching. A man stood off to the side. As my father finished, he walked up and said, see that shoe store over there? That's my store. Please come and pick out a free pair of shoes. My father rejoiced knowing that the Lord took care of his missionaries as he does all his children. I am taking to heaven the sweet memory as told by my father who is now gone. Someday I will see my father again. I will ask him to tell me again the story of street preaching and a free pair of shoes. Time is going to pass quickly, so I'm going to, to pass to one final quick story if I can. While attending BYU, I became very fond of one of my teachers in communications, Dr. Douglas R. Gibb. I thought him to be a wonderful teacher, and I appreciated all that he did. I was nearing the end of my master's program and I would be taking what was termed the comprehensive final. It was a huge thing. It took all day, writing, 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 answers. It just was amazing. 
I was, of course, worried, but I did my best. I felt good until after I received the results. I had been qualified, qualified on a statistical question. I'm not good in math, and I'm not good in stat. And when you're qualified, it means now you have to go before a board of four professors. They can ask you anything they want over all two years of your, your uh, learning. And if you can't answer it, you are washed out of the program. You have no opportunity to re-enter. I worried. You could draw the names of the professors who would sit on your board. My friend said, please pray that you don't get Dr. Whiting. He's a killer on stat. As I drew the names, my heart sunk. Dr. Whiting was one of them. I thought, what will I do? I prayed, I pondered, and then it came to me to ask Dr. Gibb if he would sit on my boards. I didn't know if I could do that. I didn't know if he could do that. But I took courage and called him, and he said, I can do that. The day came when I went in and stood before those four professors. They began asking me questions. I tried my best, and all seemed to be OK until Dr. Whiting. Dr. Whiting said, how would you measure? I thought, ah, measure. <laughs> no, that's not a good word. That's a stat question. How would you measure this, this, this? And I thought, oh. And so I started. And when I finished, I tried to smile. And he said, I don't like it. He said, you want to try it again? <sighs> yes. And I tried again, but I had nothing more to say. I tried my best. And when I was finished, he said, I do not believe you know what you're talking about. And the worst thing was, he was right. And I knew I was finished. There was nothing more I could do. I had nothing more I could say. Dr. Gibb had sat quietly the whole time. And then at that moment, he spoke up. I believe Rob might know it this way. And he then answered the question. Dr. Whiting looked at him like, what are you doing? He said, Rob, is that the way you know it? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's the way I know it. <laughs> they invited me to go stand in the hall for what I thought was ever. They brought me back in. And with Dr. Whiting scowling and with Dr. Gibbs smiling, it is the decision of this board that you be granted your master's degree from this university. I thought as I shook hands with Dr. Gibb, how can I thank you enough? In that moment when I was lost and could do no more, you stepped forward and saved me. I suddenly realized it was what my savior is. At the moment when you're drowning in sin and you cannot help yourself, the savior steps forward and saves you. Oh, it is wonderful, wonderful to me. My dear young people, you are just starting your shopping for life. I would pray that you would be wise in what you put in your shopping cart. Too many come when their shopping cart is filled with the things of the world, only to discover that you cannot take them into the next world, but rather bring home the things that bring the greatest joy and happiness forever. I know that someday I will return home to my Savior and my Father. Perhaps my Father will say to me, what did you bring home? And I will answer, much, Father, much. May be it said of you in the name of him who is assigned to bring us home, even Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.